Barakallah fikum. So thank you all for joining us. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salawat wa salam ala rasulullah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa min wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear excellent brothers and sisters, uh, members, participants. Uh, we're so honored to be with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday, the 10th of April. First and foremost, from the whole ISIP team, we want to just greet you all and say Ramadan Kareem. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of your siyams and qiyam and ibadat and good deeds, inshallah. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I know there is a lot of things that needs to be done during Ramadan. And of course, this is a month of, you know, uh, deep contemplation and tafakkur. Nevertheless, we hope that this lecture will also facilitate some aspects of uh, our ibadat, as we know that dream interpretation is such an important thing within Islamic tradition and Islamic thought. So thank you for joining us, dear brothers and sisters and colleagues from all over the world. We're so honored to have you with us. So before we present our lecturer for today, just a brief presentation of our international lecture series and ISIP. Bismillah. So today's session will be about dream interpretation with Dr. Samir Mahmoud from Australia. We're very honored to host him today. Uh, this will be two, actually, uh, we will offer two lectures with Dr. Samir with regards to the topic, because it's such a vast, topic, we will not be able to just present it during one session. So Dr. Samir uh, has requested us, uh, requested us to do two lectures, which we will be so honored to host, inshallah. So we will announce later in our you know, uh, WhatsApp groups and in our uh, newsletter and in our different platforms when the next session with Dr. Samir with regards to the topic will be conducted. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Just a little bit about today's agenda, dear excellent brothers and sisters and colleagues. We'll start by just reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, and then uh, we'll just share some uh, certificate of appreciation as always to our excellent Dr. Samir for his lecture uh, and also to all of our uh, participants here today. Dr. Samir will, uh, will have a lecture for about 60 minutes and one hour. After that, we will have a 30 minute Q&A session as well. Feel free to write your questions in the Zoom chat and we will address the questions in the end to dear uh, excellent Dr. Samir. And finally, we will just close up by just doing some du'as, inshallah. Uh, the Zoom etiquettes are basic, you know, uh, so I don't need to reiterate them again. We always mention them during all of our sessions, but, you know, just to keep your microphone mute will be uh, great, inshallah. And ask your questions in the Zoom chat. And if you need live transcriptions, uh, please press the more button uh, and then uh, press the request button and then we can give you the permission to have the live transcriptions, inshallah. Barakallah a, a short mission statement presentation of the ISIP movement. Uh, so ISIP, the International Students of Islamic Psychology, is a space designed to connect people with diverse backgrounds interested in Islamic psychology. And we aim to disseminate knowledge, share resources, and discuss best practices in a free and accessible manner. We also want to be a platform to enable further development of people's personal and professional interests, studies, and understanding of Islamic psychology within their communities and countries of origin. I think there is some microphone is on, so if, if you could just mute your microphone, I would really appreciate it. Barakallah fiku. And uh, the, the local uh, context is very important for us. So uh, despite having the international uh, umbrella as well, which is this lecture series is part of our uh, activities as the international umbrella, we also have our local and regional chapters. So we have chapters in Pakistan, India, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the Arab world, Turkey, you name it. And if you're interested to join our local and regional chapter, feel free to reach out to us either through our website or through our email address or through our WhatsApp groups. And we will share all this information in the Zoom chat through the duration of the lecture, inshallah. Feel free to also subscribe to ISIP's YouTube channel. We will upload this lecture with Dr. Samir on our YouTube channel afterwards. And feel free to join uh, the Islamic Psychology WhatsApp group number 16, where we do a lot of our resource sharing and you can be updated on what's happening within the field of Islamic psychology all around the world. And all these links and information will be shared in the Zoom chat. And feel also free to join our website where you can actually become a member. And when you become a member, you will have access to our digital library 
free of charge with over 1,000 resources within the field of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health. So yes, this is just a short presentation. And now let's move forward to what is most important today, of course, which is um, to present our excellent scholar, teacher, Murabi. Uh, he's actually a personal teacher of mine. I'm very honored to, to, to have Dr. Samir as a teacher uh, at the Cambridge Muslim College. Uh, Dr. Samir works as a lecturer uh, on the BA in Islamic studies, and he is both a lecturer and a course a coordinator for the Islamic psychology diploma program at Cambridge Muslim College. Dr. Samir is also the academic director of Usul Academy, and we will share the information about Usul Academy as well in the Zoom chat afterwards. Uh, he has previously been assistant professor at the Lebanese American University. He holds an MA in architectural history, theory, and urban design at the University of New South Wales, Australia. He has an MPHI in theology and religious studies with a focus on competitive philosophy and aesthetics. PhD in Islamic Studies from the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Dr. Timothy Winter, also known as Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. We also want to give you, uh, Dr. Samir, a, a certificate of appreciation. This is for the whole ISIP team uh, from, Dr., uh, from Sister Fatima, Sister Eileen, Sister Shireen, and Sister Roa, and myself and the rest of the team. We want to really uh, send our regards to you and really show our appreciation for your really your time, your efforts, and also recognize all the excellency you're doing within the field of Islamic psychology and of course, Islamic thought. And we will send this through email to you afterwards. And we really appreciate you taking your time, Dr. Samir. We know you have so much to do and we're so honored to have you with us. Barakallahu feekum. We also just want to update all of our excellent participants, dear brothers and sisters and colleagues that our upcoming session will be Saturday, the April 23rd. And the speaker will be Professor Ramzi Talib from Canada. And the topic will be the psychology of Ramadan, examining the spirituality of the month and the nafs. It's a really interesting topic and we hope that you all will join. And we will share information in our WhatsApp group and through email as well. This is also just uh, Ramadan greetings to all of you, excellent colleagues. And we hope that this is a month for all of you filled with love and blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we hope that his love and blessings will be showered upon all of you. Barakallahu feekum. And so thank you for attending. And let me now stop sharing my screen so that we'll give over the space to our excellent teacher and scholar, Dr. Samir. So without any further ado, the floor is yours. Welcome, Dr. Samir. Uh, thank you, Sidi uh, Sayyid Jamal al-Din. <laughs> Wonderful and very generous introduction, mashallah. Uh, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafi al-anbiya wa wa salim. Muhammad bin Ibn Abdullah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa taslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this wonderful session organized by ISIP um, on their dreams and their uh, interpretation in the Islamic uh, tradition. As, as uh, Sayyid Jamal al-Din pointed out, um, inshallah, um, uh, the, the topic of uh, dreams and dream interpretation is a vast field of knowledge, um, uh, at least in the Islamic tradition. And so um, there's no way I can, I can really exhaust the topic in one presentation. So what I've uh, suggested, well, what I've suggested um, uh, is to uh, have two presentations on the topic. Uh, the first, uh, the nature of dreams and dreaming, and then the second would focus on uh, dream interpretations and their meanings. So I'm going to do part one today. Um, part two will have to be done on another day, inshallah. Um, and I know a lot of people are keen to jump straight to uh, the issue of interpretation of dreams, but I think um, it is important to spend as much time first and foremost on understanding what dreams actually are, um, uh, the nature of dreams, their epistemic possibilities, etc. Because without understanding what a dream actually is, um, there's no point in moving on to uh, the nature of its meaning and its possible interpretation. So, uh, inshallah, in the next hour, I'm going to be focusing on part one. And in the near future, inshallah, we can have um, a part two uh, to get into those kind of dream interpretation uh, manuals that many of you may own and have on, the sh on your shelves in your homes, inshallah. 
So the structure of uh, part one will be um, a brief look at dreams in the Quran and the Sunnah, and then um, providing a preliminary definition of what a dream actually is. And what I mean by a preliminary definition, uh, it's a working definition. So it's not an exhaustive definition. And then move on to uh, the really, really important uh, understanding of how dreams actually work. Um, many of us pick up volumes and volumes of works on dream interpretation without understanding actually have how dreams function and how they work and how they become dreams in the first place. And then the different types of dreams, which also affects our capacity to interpret them later. Um, and how do we distinguish between the different types of dreams? Or at least preliminary um, criteria for distinguishing between different types of dreams, which will then de delve uh, deeper into uh, later in part two, inshallah. Now, the way I've gone about um, doing this presentation is um, it's, it's not going to be um, a lot of quotes from primary sources uh, for a very simple reason. It would overwhelm the presentation and to take too much time to, to cover. And um, many of the terms in Arabic uh, are quite complex. What I've opted to do and what I prefer to do usually in talks like this is to uh, translate the conceptual frameworks of this classical understanding of dreams into a contemporary, let's say, template or paradigm um, or framework um, that then you can use quite easily. And I think doing that is, is uh, much more effective um, than uh, spending too much time on uh, the Arabic sources themselves, um, because uh, many of you may, may or may not know Arabic, um, and, and it may lead to some degree of confusion, inshallah. Um, in any process of simplification, um, it means that uh, some parts are left out, but the simplification does not mean that uh, I'm doing any violence to the material itself. What I'm doing is I'm just translating it into a workable paradigm or workable framework that we can then uh, use uh, quite effectively. So in that sense, the presentations I'm giving, this part one and part two in the near future, inshallah, are not exhaustive, which means there's a lot more that can be said. I think uh, something like this uh, should be a course ultimately. Um, because of the uh, vast amount of material available out there, inshallah. So uh, dreams have always existed in human culture. As early as human uh, existence on Earth, dreams have existed. Of course, that would be several presentation in and of itself. Uh, but what I want to do uh, in the next two slides is look at um, the role of dreams um, in the early Islamic tradition, particularly in the Quran and the Sunnah. Because we see uh, in the very Quran itself um, that dreams play a fundamental role in the lives of the prophets. In all of these verses, if you read them carefully while I uh, speak, you'll see that um, dreams uh, play an interesting role as intermediaries um, or uh, something of a message that is brought um, from somewhere to somewhere else. And I'm keeping it uh, this uh, vague and this general because um, the Quran focuses almost exclusively on uh, good types of dreams that come from the unseen world into the seen world. Of course, not all dreams are like that, uh, and we'll see that a little bit later, inshallah. Um, so uh, bear in mind that the dreams that are often discussed in the Quran, uh, the types of dreams that convey a message, convey uh, meanings, or convey something from the unseen world uh, to the seen world. Um, and uh, if we look at the example of uh, Yusuf alayhi salam, one of the most famous dreams in the Quran, we can see very clearly that um, he had a dream, um, a dream or a vision, in which uh, the seven, the eleven stars, or stars and heavens and the moon, the planets, uh, were prostrating themselves before him. Um, and the full interpretation of the dream uh, unfolded or came to fruition or became realized. Uh, many, many decades later. So in this sense, um, the dream not only conveys a message from the unseen into the seen world, but also it is anticipatory in the sense that uh, it declares um, something about an event that has yet to happen in 
uh, our timeline or in, in our temporal succession of events in the, in the physical world. We also see, for example, that a uh, dream was a means uh, through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conveyed a message to Ibrahim alayhi salam about his son, the sacrifice of his son. Um, and um, in both instances, both the dream of Yusuf alayhi salam and the dream of Ibrahim, we see that uh, dreams often uh, convey messages, but uh, through symbols, uh, not directly. And the reason being, as we'll see later, is because usually dreams convey a message um, that cannot be conveyed except in symbolic form. And, and there's a lot to be said about that. Uh, uh, in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, we see uh, he had a vision, a dream um, of visiting the Kaaba. Um, he saw himself uh, with his head shaved, entering the Kaaba with, with the keys of the Kaaba in his hand. Um, and this was an, an anticipatory dream a dream that anticipates events in the future, which was later realized and confirmed in the, uh, the Quranic verse that you see at the end of this slide. So dreams play a fundamental role uh, in the Quran as a means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates something in a symbolic form uh, to uh, chosen individuals. These could be prophets, and in some instances they're not necessarily prophets, as we'll see in the next slide. Um, there's the Sunnah in the Sunnah, the dream, dreams play a fundamental role, uh, even in the life of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu ancestors. Um, we know from the Seerah that uh, the Prophet's grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, had a dream in which he was told to dig in a particular spot uh, in which he then found the uh, well of Zamzam, which had been concealed for centuries. We know through traditions that, um, uh, through Aisha radiallahu anha, that the Prophet Sallallahu earliest um, revelations or messages from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came in the form of dreams. This is important because we're going to see a little bit later that there is a relationship between uh, dreams and prophecy. In the hadith of Abu Huraira, uh, the Prophet uh, when he finished his morning prayers, he used to ask the Sahaba or anyone he saw if they had a dream. And he said, after me, there would be nothing left of prophethood except good dreams. Uh, suggesting that um, not only a fundamental link between dreams and prophecy, but prophecy, uh, dreams is uh, a type of spiritual perception, if you will, that um, is prophetic, that prophets possess, but also non-prophets uh, uh, possess. And after the end of prophecy, with the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the only thing left of prophecy uh, Will, uh, will be uh, good dreams. So individuals after the Prophet ﷺ will still be able to have good dreams, but this uh, is um, uh, a, 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 a prophetic uh, power or gift that um, it is shared by both prophets and non-prophets at the same time. And we'll see a little bit later, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says that dreams are one forty-six part of prophecy, which means that dreams are a unique, gift given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to human beings in general, but in particular to uh, good and righteous individuals um, in which they're capable of receiving messages from the unseen and uh, forms of knowledge that are otherwise um, impossible to possess either through our senses or through our intellect. Again, in the hadith of the Prophet he says, nothing is left of prophethood except al-mubashirat, which is another word for uh, good dreams, the true good dreams that convey glad tidings. Again, uh, here we have a, another confirmation that um, the, this, of this link between the dreams of righteous individuals and prophets or prophecy. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ had a dream himself, again, in the Sunnah. And there are many, many of these examples in which he saw um, he, that he was brought a cup of milk and drank it, and then he interpreted the dream as meaning uh, knowledge. So milk meaning knowledge. And so it is the interpretation of his own dreams and the dreams of the Sahaba from which we get the primary material for how to interpret dreams in the Islamic tradition. In part two, we're going to uh, explore some of these sources like, um, like Ibn, uh, Ibn Sirin and Ibn Shaheen and Abdul Ghani Nabursi and others. 
um, who've written some of the most um, uh, well-known manuals on dream interpretation. But they all come down to the corpus of uh, traditions in which the Prophet Sallam himself interpreted uh, dreams. We also find in the Sunnah um, many Sahaba having dreams. One of the most prominent ones <clears throat> is the dream of Abdullah bin Zayd, in which it was revealed to him, the Adhan was revealed to him. So at the time, Muslims had um, were trying to figure out how to call people to prayer. And uh, Abdullah bin Zayd had a dream in which it was revealed to him. And the Prophet ﷺ confirmed <clears throat> that indeed this dream was a form of uh, inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And very quickly they announced the call to prayer uh, based on the formula revealed to uh, Abdullah bin Zayd in that particular dream. So um, <clears throat> here, clear examples that many of the events of the Sunnah also, uh, and the anticipation of many battles, and events in the life of the Prophet ﷺ uh, will all happen through uh, through dreams. And if we were to list them, they'd amount to thousands. If you open the section on dreams in Imam al-Bukhari's Sahih, you'll see uh, a lot of these dreams uh, listed there. So we come back to our fundamental question, what is a dream? Um, and I've, as I said, I've offered a very preliminary definition. It's a, it's a work in progress, as it were, in the sense that um, it's not exhaustive, but it gives us, gives us at this particular point in our presentation uh, a preliminary understanding of, of a dream. So a dream is a succession of uh, images, visions, ideas, emotions, and sensations that usually occur involuntarily in the mind's eye during certain stages of sleep. There's a lot to be unpacked here. And this, would, this is a standard definition you might find in several types of dictionaries about what a dream actually is. Um, it's kind of a, a neutral definition, as it were. So a dream, a succession of images, where when we dream, we have images that come like a film that are played in the mind's eye, um, uh, uh, visions, maybe not just images, but visions also, they may convey kind of cognitive content in regards to ideas. They may have emotional um, uh, moods and overtones. So um, there's an emotional content there. Um, and sensations. Uh, some of these have uh, a visceral uh, sensation that comes with them that usually occur involuntarily. So dreams are not things that we uh, produce, um, at least not consciously. Uh, when we go into uh, sleep, we become involuntary beings, as it were. And uh, uh, in our deepest stages of sleep, uh, dreams usually occur, especially the uh, highest forms of dreams, as it were. And they're played like a like a, a movie in the mind's eye, like a theater movie. Uh, perhaps a deeper, more qualified definition would add that, at least in the Islamic tradition, that certain types of dreams, so this definition applies to all types of dreams, but uh, higher forms of dreams, as we'll see later, um, are uh, forms of spiritual perception also, uh, forms of spiritual perception uh, that penetrate through the veils of the seen world into the unseen world, Alam al um, And this has to do with the many several traditions of the Prophet ﷺ where he says um, that uh, when we sleep, our soul or spirit uh, leaves the body and ascends various levels uh, of reality. Um, and um, in that modality of existence, um, it is able to see things that is not possible with the physical eyes. Hence, the mind's eye, or al basira, or the inner eye um, of our of our being or self. Um, now, it's important to distinguish here the Islamic understanding of dreams from the most prominent two types of um, understandings of dreams. I don't want to get into a comparison with Freud and Jung here because I don't want to waste time on that particular issue. We can do that uh, in part two when we talk about dream interpretation. But suffice it to say here that the Islamic understanding of dreams are profoundly, uh, is profoundly different from Freud's understanding of dreams as somehow latent wish fulfillments of our uh, lower self or our, our, um, our sexual drives that somehow manifest in dreams because when we dream, uh, the conscious self uh, subsides or all the barriers of censorship uh, uh, dropped somehow, and 
things that are not available to our conscious self become uh, available or wish wishes and desires that are that are um, that are uh, controlled or um, limited or um, uh, by the the super ego are then uh, somehow the id penetrates uh, through into the dreams um, and its desires become uh, manifest um, and all, all but it's it, of the two Freud and Jung Perhaps Jung has a more favorable understanding of dreams that uh, is similar yet fundamentally also different uh, from the Islamic tradition. So we don't need to get into that, but uh, Jung uh, does um, have a, I would say, a more profound understanding of dreams uh, than Freud, uh, especially in his understanding of uh, symbolism and the fact that dreams can act as dreams are much more than just uh, embodiments of wish fulfillment, but they are somehow messages from a realm beyond however we define that realm beyond, uh, in symbolic form, uh, in order for us to um, uh, become whole and complete. So there's a, a much more profound, deeper understanding of what a dream is in the Jungian tradition. When we get to part two, inshallah, we'll compare the uh, methods and approaches uh, uh, much more closely, inshallah. Now, I just want to highlight an important point here, um, an, an aspect uh, of uh, dreams that exist in the Islamic tradition, particularly in uh, Imr Ghazali, that I think is often not uh, discussed as extensively as it should. Uh, and that is, and, and it, it reflects the nature of dreams itself. And that is dreams as proof for the existence of prophecy. Um, if we were to ask ourselves a simple question, what kind of truth does a dream convey? Or what is the epistemological status of a dream? Uh, what, it, what is it? What kind of knowledge, form of knowledge is it? Or is it a form of knowledge in the first place? Um, we find an interesting answer to this question in al muqaz bin al dalal um, He's the famous work by Imam al-Ghazali, one of his later works in which uh, is often described as an autobiographical account of his journey and life. Um, at the very beginning of the book, he questions the validity of the senses and the capacity to uh, convey knowledge to us. So. Uh, you know, sometimes when you look up at the sky, you may see the sun as a small disk. But we know through our mind, our intellect, our reason, that the sun is a huge sphere uh, of so many, you know, millions of, uh, I don't know, kilometers or dimensions, right? Uh, and so we know, for example, that the senses can show us things uh, as different from what they actually are. Um, and so when the senses uh, uh, deceive us, uh, you may see a silhouette of something um, at dusk and think it's a human being, it turns out it's a tree. Uh, so this is a, another example of how the senses can deceive us. Um, the intellect is a judge that verifies whether um, uh, what the senses are telling us are true or not. So the, 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 the intellect acts as a, as a judge to confirm the truth or validity of, of something. Can, can someone please put their uh, mute, uh, mute on the microphone, please? Thank you very much. Um, and so uh, Imam al-Ghazali uh, does an exercise, an interesting exercise, where he um, he asks a, a further question. He says, um, what if there is something beyond the intellect that can show me that the standards of truth established by reason, like logic and uh, all the principles of, of, of logic and reason, um, are themselves potentially also uh, uh, potentially incorrect? Maybe the intellect just deceives me. Just in the same way that the intellect is a capacity for perceiving that uh, goes beyond the senses and is able to judge the senses right or wrong. Uh, is there a faculty beyond the intellect that can say, well, that the intellect is also potentially like the senses, that it can deceive me? Um, and he, uh, he, he suggests that perhaps uh, dreaming is... Um, that tawr wa al aql, that realm, that faculty of knowledge that transcends uh, reason itself, uh, because within the dream world and within dreaming, uh, there are certain things uh, that happen and unfold, and the very act of dreaming itself seems to uh, uh, transcend the limitations of reason and the intellect itself. Um, it's similar to the kind of exercise um, that uh, Quan Zhu, uh, Chinese sage, did, where he dreamt that he was a butterfly and then woke up. But then when he woke up, he, he, he realized, what if I'm a butterfly dreaming that I'm Quan Zhu? Uh, so um, how do we know? How, <laughs> how do we, how can we, what if, uh, uh, you know, I'm one thing dreaming, I'm another. 
Um, this kind of, uh, let's say, epistemological um, doubt plagued Imam al-Ghazali uh, at some point, and uh, he realized, well, he wasn't able to realize the truth of the matter until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him through casting a, a light in his heart. But the point of this uh, is, is to show, is, of this, um, this exercise that he did, is um, to show that there are um, means of knowing things that neither the senses nor the intellect can really fully understand. And sleeping or dream within sleeping is one of those. God Most High has brought the matter within the purview of his creatures by giving them a sample of the sleeping, of the special character of the prophetic power, sleeping. So if you want to understand what prophecy is, if you're not able to understand it in any other way, Allah SWT has made it easy for you. Sleeping and dreaming within sleeping is proof that prophecy exists. Why? Well, it's simple. We know the Prophet ﷺ said that um, the dream, a good dream is one forty-sixth part of prophecy. But also, when we have dreams, uh, especially particular types of dreams, uh, we gain certain kinds of knowledge that neither the senses nor the intellect are capable of. Knowledge that is similar to the kind of knowledge we know that prophets uh, uh, possessed. Um, and so, because in the dreams we can attain to certain kinds of knowledge that cannot be explained except by saying that it is God-given knowledge. Take, for example, the vision of the Prophet ﷺ. You have a dream of the Prophet. We've never seen the Prophet ﷺ. None of us have seen him. You know, he was born and died centuries ago. And yet we can have a vision uh, of him, or we can have a dream of Judgment Day, or events beyond our time-space continuum, angels, uh, the divine throne, even events that have yet to happen. How does one explain the anticipatory capacity of dreams to show us events precisely as they unfold, before they unfold? Uh, for Memel Ghazali, this is proof that there is this thing called knowledge uh, beyond the capacity of the senses and the intellect, that there is a knowledge got, granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the unseen. And so the fact that dreams exist, good dreams exist, is proof that um, prophecy exists because if dreams are one fourth the sixth part of prophecy, then if dreams exist, then prophecy must exist. Right? Um, and so this this argument is really interesting. I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd leave it with you because um, uh, M. Ghazali is drawing our attention to an experience that we all have, that we have proof of prophecy within us. Um, and this is uh, an additional proof of prophecy for those of you familiar with uh, the proofs of prophecy in the various. Uh, books of Aqidah. This is an additional proof that I think is rarely mentioned in some of those texts. Um, when we move on to trying to understand what Imam al-Ghazali actually meant by uh, dreams and dreaming as a faculty of perception beyond the capacity of or beyond the realm of the senses and intellect, I think uh, Ibn Arabi, Sheikh um, Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi has one of the most um, complex and sophisticated exposition on the nature of dreams um, ever produced um, um, uh, in the Islamic tradition and, and beyond. And he says, uh, confirming Imam al-Ghazali, he says, the only reason God placed sleep in the animal world was so that every night, so that everyone might know that there is another world similar to the sensory world. If you want to know, or if you want to seek proof that there is a realm beyond the sensory world, the realm of the ghayb, or the realm of the unseen, if you want experiential proof of it, you already have it at your fingertips. For the dream world, uh, we're talking about dreams here in the, in, the, uh, in the sense of good dreams. The dream world is a living proof of that because these kinds of dreams show you beyond any doubt through your own experience and gives you knowledge of things you can't possibly know through rational thought or through sense perception. And he explained that the capacity to dream is, a, is, a, is by means of the faculty of imagination. A dreaming individual is capable of seeing disembodied intelligible realities in the form of corporeal sensory objects. I'm going to explain what this means um, in a minute. Um, so let's get to that. Um, khayal then becomes the means by which dreams work. How does a dream work? Um, through imagination. Now, Imagination is probably one of the most important epistemological faculties that we human beings possess. Um, it is certainly one of the most important faculties of knowledge in the Islamic tradition. 
um, many of you may be raising your eyebrows and surprised uh, at, at what I'm saying, because for us, imagination or khayal is sim simply the capacity to conjure up things that don't exist. Uh, but that's a false definition of what khayal actually is. Um, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. So please, um, in the next few slides, which are quite dense, um, uh, do, uh, do, do take note of the very important distinctions between different types of imagination, inshallah. Uh, in, first of all, it's important to distinguish between uh, what is often referred to in the Islamic tradition as the three worlds. So we have the human being, um, uh, the first level of reality, the first level or the first world is the physical world. If you look at your body, your body senses and perceives things in the physical world. Um, but you don't only, the human being doesn't only exist in a physical world. We also exist um, along a spectrum from the physical to the spiritual. Um, and in between the spiritual, which is purely formless, um, and the physical world, which is purely formal, right, a concrete, um, there's an intermediary realm, um, which, um, uh, and the intermediary realm is the realm of the soul. So uh, what is a soul? A soul is basically a spirit in a body. When a spirit exists in a body, it's called the soul. That's when we refer to, so when we refer to the human being in terms of spirit, the ruh, the ruh is that part of the human being and that is their essence, which is not mingled with the body. When we talk about the nafs, we're talking about the spirit that is mingled with the body. So the human being consists of what? Human being consists of a spirit in a body, and that creates a third entity called the soul. Now, uh, we can divide the world of the soul, the intermediate realm of the nafs, into a higher level and a lower level. So um, within your nafs, within your soul, you have a part of you that's closer to your high spirit, your spirit, which is pure um, spirit, disembodied. And there's a part of you that's closer to your body and its desires and functioning. And let's call, your, let's call it your psyche, your psychological dimension. So within the soul, within the nafs, um, and we can relate this to the three different types of nafs mentioned in the Quran, nafs al-ammara, um, nafs al-lawama, and nafs al mutmainna now, these are three different levels that exist within the soul. I'm mentioning just two here for simplicity's sake. So within your soul, um, there is a higher part of you that is linked to your pure spirit, and there's a lower part of you that is linked to your pure body and its desires. Okay. Now, um, the lower is linked, well, the spirit is linked to the spiritual world and the psychological is linked to the uh, the physical world. One might even add a, a further distinction, we call it psychosomatic, which is that part of your psyche that is uh, even, even more bound up with physiological uh, changes. So uh, you have your body and then you have your psyche, but there's a part of the psyche that's closer to the physiological aspect of your body. There's a part of your psyche that's closer to a bit higher um, and then there's the spiritual part of your soul uh, that's closer to the pure spirit and then there's your, your pure spirit so there are various levels within our um, uh, and these three levels the spiritual the psychological the psychosomatic they exist within each and every one of us so i, I hope this important this distinction is, uh, is clear because it's the basis and foundation for everything else i'm going to talk about inshallah okay all right so We've talked about the three worlds. Now, when we talk about imagination, it's important to bear in mind that the imagination is a faculty of the soul, khayal. Um, but there are different types of imagination. Right? What is imagination? It's the capacity to, uh, Im uh, to, to, to bring up images in the mind's eye. Um, and the imagination here, as you can see uh, clearly in this diagram, uh, is a faculty of our soul, this intermediary. So in the same way that our senses are the faculties of the body, 
and our pure intellect is a faculty of disembodied intelligible realities. Our khayal is the faculty of this intermediary world of the soul. And the khayal functions through images. Now, the Islamic tradition makes a very important distinction, especially in the tradition of Ibn Arabi, very important distinction between two types of imagination. There's the khayal muttasil, conjoined imagination, i.e. the imagination that is bound up with your psychological constitution. And that's the kind of imagination that conjures up fantasy images and make-believe and all sorts of different things. Um, and that's the one we tend to think of when we think of imagination. When we say imagination is something that conjures up images that are not real. But that's unfortunate because the Islamic tradition also points out that there is a higher type of imagination. And that is the khayal al-munfasil, disjoint. Why is it munfasil? Why is it disjoint or disconnected? Because it's not bound up with your psychological constitution but it's rather part of your spiritual constitution, spiritual imagination. Um, and as you can see here, the conjoined imagination, the imagination that is bound up with your psychological uh, constitution, usually conjures up what is called fantasy or waham. Waham are conjured up images that are not really real, but uh, it's important and the influence is usually um, uh, the way the imagination functions is important to rem remember. Um, and, and the imagination, all sorts of imagination, whether it's the disjoined imagination or the conjoined imagination, they function in the same way. Imagination um, gives forms to things that don't have forms. Yani, the imagination here in this realm of the soul borrows images from the physical world that you perceive with your body and gives uses these images to clothe spiritual realities that have no form that's why when you have visions of things from alam al ghayb which essentially have no form you see them in, in particular forms why because your imagination is clothing them or giving them form um, and where does it get these forms from? It gets it from what is called the storehouse of the imagination or the storehouse of images. What is a storehouse of images? Basically, it's that storehouse and repository of images of all the things you've seen in your life in the physical world. So sometimes you may see courage in the form of a lion. You see knowledge in the form of milk. I mean, knowledge has no form, right? But how do we see these things with forms in dreams, right? Because the way imagination works, whether it's the lower imagination, whether we're talking about the psychological imagination, or whether we're talking about the spiritual imagination, imagination works in a very similar way. It, derive, it gives forms to things that have no form. And where does it get these forms from? It gets them from the storehouse of images that we have stored up in our memory, stored up in our mind, as a result of all the things we've seen um, in, in our world. That's why um, all the things we see in imagination um, appear in forms that are familiar to us. Right? Milk is something that's familiar. Uh, now, there's always a relationship between the thing or the form and the thing that is giving form to. So for example, we know that milk nourishes. We also know that knowledge nourishes. So there's a link between um, knowledge and the form that knowledge appears in in a dream. We'll talk about that uh, in part two when we go on to the uh, uh, talk about the interpretation of dreams. What I want you to take away from this presentation: two things. First of all, the way in which imagination works, it gives forms to things that have no form by uh, deriving images from the storehouse of images. And second, um, it um, uh, there are two types of imagination. There's the higher imagination, let's call it the spiritual imagination, um, that is a higher spiritual capacity for perception that we possess within us, the eye of the heart, if you will. Um, and that usually gives us higher dreams. And there's the psychological imagination, the lower kind of imagination that we usually use when we daydream or we fantasize or, uh, you know, when we try to think of writing a book or a novel or a sketch or something like that. Right? 
but there are two types of imagination. A third important thing I want to mention before we move on beyond this slide is the following. Um, spiritual realities in the spiritual world have no form. So um, when they appear in the soul, they're given a form from the physical world. Uh, yeah, a physical form from the physical world. Um, when we see something in the physical world in a dream, we see its form disembodied. Right? Let's say you see your father in a, in a dream. You don't see your physical father, literally, but you see the image, the form of your father. So what the dream imagination does is, when you see things from the physical world in your dream, it disembodies them. It keeps the form. Why? Because essentially it has a form. When it sees, when you see things from the spiritual world in your in your uh, khayal, it gives them a body because it has intrinsically no body and no form. So one way of saying it is, uh, the imagination spiritualizes or disembodies physical things, um, and the imagination embodies um, spiritual things. So I hope this, this distinction is, 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 is clear now, these three important points. Okay, so let's move on to uh, images. So what types of images do each of these imaginations produce? I've already alluded to um, the fact that uh, the conjoined imagination of our psyche or the psychological imagination produces uh, wahem, fantasy. Um, the spiritual world, Sorry, um, okay, so, uh, okay, let's just put all that out there, yeah. Okay, so, um, fantasy or wahem are illusory images, they're not real, right? Um, above them, there are types of images we may call psychological images that are still within the conjoined imagination, but they're not illusory, they're uh, part of our psychological uh, 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 um, constitution, but they're a bit more serious, um, and we'll talk about these uh, a little bit later. And then there are spiritual images. Spiritual images, uh, these are images that we have when we have visions of the unseen world. And so there are different types of images that correspond to different types of imagination. So if fantasy and wahm is the lowest type of imagination, um, so here, as you can see, I've split the conjoined imagination into two types. There's the lower fantasy wahem, and there's a psychological imagination. So there are certain things we kind of, when we construct a narrative of a story uh, that's quite meaningful, um, when you're writing a book or something like that, um, uh, one can say that it's it's not pure wahem or fantasy. Um, it could be uh, psychological imagination. Also, some forms of art belong to this category. Um, spiritual imagination produces spiritual images and their source is from the unseen world. So these come from above. These images come from below, usually. Um, and that's important to bear in mind. So there are different types of imagination and corresponding to each type of imagination, there are different types of uh, images, different types of images. Okay, so this brings us to these important distinctions, bring us to different types of dreams. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at this uh, diagram again. The human being is on a spectrum that includes the body and the soul. And um, the soul can be divided up into psychological sphere and the spiritual sphere. <clears throat> and beyond that is a divine sphere which is the divine, uh, divine realm, which is not uh, the, the realm of the human beings. And uh, we can see here the, the threshold of time and space. So beyond this particular level of reality, um, we are beyond time and space itself. At the level of the body, we have bodily experiences. So we don't have dreams, we have bodily experiences. At the level of the psychological sphere, we have lower types of dreams, what the Islamic tradition often refers to as adhafu ahlam. And these are the lowest types of dreams that are basically bound up with our, our psychosomatic constitution and result a lot from physiological processes. They result from physiological processes. 
Now, within the psychological sphere, there's also another category of dreams, which I've referred to as uh, manamat nafsaniya, or psychological dreams. Because in the Islamic tradition, in the hadith at least, when uh, the word ahlam is referred to, or hilm, it's usually negative. It means something that's bound up with some physical desire or physical... Uh, uh. Manamat has a more of a positive connotation. And that's why I call it manamat nafsaniya, which means a manam or dream that is linked to our psychological um, uh, narrative or psychological uh, self. Um, above that, in the spiritual sphere of our being, we have what might one may call spiritual dreams and visions. So um, these are there are also two distinctions within here. Spiritual dreams are dreams that are very close to the boundary with our psychological constitution, but they have a spiritual quality or dimension to them. Our visions are on the upper boundary of our spiritual world that link us to the alam al ghaib and the divine sphere. This is, uh, these are called ru'ya sadiqa. These are the kind of dreams that Prophet Sallallahu mentioned when he said that these are part of prophecy, 146 part of prophecy. Um, and these are the type of dreams, the mubashirat or the, uh, the visions that, uh, where people often describe seeing the Prophet Sallallahu in a dream. Uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith Sahih says, so whoever sees me in a dream has seen me for real, for the shaitan cannot assume my form. Um, these are the visions that you often have of al-akhirah, of al-arsh, of things in the, in the upper realms of reality that come to us from above. We don't conjure them up. We can't possibly imagine them on our own. They come to us from another world. Um, and these are the highest forms of dreams that we can potentially have. As you see in, in this diagram also, I've pointed out here that uh, in different uh, uh, levels of dreams or in different types of dreams, there are different dimensions of time. Uh, I'll talk more about this um, when we talk about Tafsir al-Manan. But it's important to bear in mind that when we enter into the dream world, we're entering into a, ti a, a time-space um, dimensions that are not of the physical world, which means um, time is experienced differently and space is experienced differently. I think in, in pop culture, one particular movie brings out this quality quite well, although I think it's, a, it's a, not uh, the best type of movie. But Inception, the movie Inception, uh, really shows the different dimensions of time at different layers of the dream. The problem with Inception is, though, it's preoccupied with this lower realm of dreams here. Um, Inception is a journey of the protagonist into lower levels of the self rather than higher levels of the self. It doesn't deal with this realm here. It really de deals with uh, the psychological um, uh, mires and, uh, and uh, issues and problems that the protagonist had. But nonetheless, um, it does quite beautifully demonstrate and show the different dimensions of time and different relations of space um, in different um, kind, types of dreams. Now, distinguishing between uh, uh, dreams is important, the different types of dreams. And later on, when we talk about interpretation, we'll, we'll look at more accurate categories or criteria for um, distinguishing, because this is an important. But what I want to highlight here is, um, and, uh, is the important capacity to distinguish between the spiritual and the psychological. In today's world, in many Freudian Jungian traditions, in many uh, new age kind of spirituality today, there's a confusion of the spiritual and the psychological. And uh, in the Islamic tradition, we have a very clear distinction between them. And why distinguishing between them is important is because we not confuse um, something from the lower realm with something coming to us from the higher realm and vice versa. So, um, when we look at this diagram here, it's important to distinguish the psychological sphere uh, is a relationship between the lower um, to our psychological constitution. The spiritual sphere is something that brings us images from above, experiences from above. And so, when we talk about the different kinds of dreams, like the lower dreams, the 
they are frivolous with no substantial meaning or significance. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, you you go to sleep, uh, you know, you've been hungry all day, you have a dream of yourself sitting in a large bowl of pasta eating it. Um, now, that's meaningful insofar as that it tells you something about physiological condition. What I mean by it's frivolous with no substantial meaning or significance, um, meaning that it doesn't have any higher meaning. It's really bound up with physiological processes and understanding them is quite easy and straightforward. Um, when we talk about psychological dreams or manamat nafsaniya, it becomes a bit more complicated. Uh, these are meaningful encounters with images, visions, and meanings that are largely produced by our own psychological stream of consciousness. And they have profound meaning to us and for us because they are largely from us. And these are the type of dreams that we usually have about um, our own psychological journey through life, uh, confronting various aspects of ourselves or various other significant people in our lives, um, um, things that we may, may repress and things that may appear to us in a dream, in a guise that we need to interpret in order to adjust our external behavior in the real world, etc. These are meaningful, but they're meaningful insofar as they uh, carry significance and meaning for us um, almost exclusively. And I say almost exclusively. Um, the higher level of dreams, which is, crosses the boundary into the spiritual sphere or our spiritual constitution, uh, what I call Ru'ya Ruhaniya. They are meaningful because they happen, come to us from above, and they're linked to Ahwal and certain spiritual states. These are kind of dreams that um, usually reflect something about our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, they're dreams that pertain to um, um, uh, our spiritual trajectory. They're not purely about our psychological life, the ego, and as it struggles with other individuals in our day-to-day -day life. Um, when we talk about psychological dreams and lower dreams, we're talking about a horizontal level of, of meaning and interaction. When we start talking about spiritual dreams, we're talking about a vertical axis, where it's about our relationship to higher levels of reality, higher levels of being, and our relationship ultimately to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The highest form of these are spiritual visions and encounters with prophets in dreams, of the throne, uh, angels, etc., etc. Right, and these possess a degree of reality more real than the physical world. It's important to bear in mind something I should have pointed out earlier. Uh, each one of these levels of reality, bodily, the level of the soul, uh, the psyche, and the soul, uh, these are levels of reality. And while we may today in our hyper-materialist world consider the physical world the most real in ontological terms. In Islamic tradition, the, the physical world is real, but it's not the most real. Uh, higher levels of reality possess a degree of reality more real than this one. And, uh, uh, and so when we experience something, generally we experience something from the higher realms in terms of a vision, a ru'ya, sadiqa. Anyone who's ever had an experience like this in a dream, in a vision, will describe it as something very clear, lucid, and more real than anything they've ever encountered in the physical world. Um, I've met many people, um, and this is a test for all of us out there, um, when asked, what are the top five meaningful experiences in your life? Um, some people will say, and I've met people who say, um, this, is, this is a true story, um, most meaningful, um, experience I've had is um, I've met uh, the first man to, cl to climb Everest um, when I got married, my first baby, um, and some other experiences that have to do with uh, some holiday or something like that. Um, people who have, have had spiritual experience will almost unanimously mention their dream on the top of uh, that list. They will make sense say something like this. I had a vision of the Prophet in a dream. I got married, uh, my first child, and something like that. And, he, and someone uh, observing, someone who's not really a spiritual person observing may say, how can someone like that have consider something that's not real as the most authentic, true experience? Um, 
it's precisely because it is more real than anything in the physical world that it is listed as uh, the most uh, significant high point in their life. So uh, because they come from an ontological level of reality that is more real than the lower levels of reality, uh, visions are encountered with such a luminosity about them that is more intense than anything in the physical world. And that's important to bear in mind. And often that's considered one of the criteria. Now, what has happened in the modern world, and I shouldn't labor the point too much because we're already uh, on the limit, but um, what has happened in the modern world is that there is a catastrophic confusion between the psychological and the spiritual, um, such that the spiritual sphere has descended and collapsed into the psychological. And that leads to catastrophic confusions in categories because, um, because what happens is, uh, especially today, people rarely are able to distinguish between psychological experiences and spiritual experiences. Um, in the next presentation, inshallah, I'm gonna start with uh, uh, this important distinction because it, it leads to uh, understanding the distinction between the psychological and the spiritual means that we understand the distinction between the types of images that come from the psychological world and the images that come from the spiritual world. And therefore we're able to understand the distinction between the dreams that come in the psychological world and the dreams that come in the spiritual world. Um, it's important to make these distinctions between them uh, because as we'll see later next time, inshallah, the traces left behind by these distinct images and distinct experiences are very, very different. Um, as one commentator once pointed out, it is very important not to confuse the warmth of the fire from below uh, with the warmth of the light from above. Um, people often may go, uh, give, to give you an analogy, people may go to, um, I don't know, some rock concert and uh, experience, have a kind of an experiential oceanic feeling of oneness with the entire crowd, which is uh, an experience that is quite common uh, that people have when they're in a large crowd, especially when it's synchronized to a particular type of music. Um, now, the individuals who are not able to distinguish between the psychological sphere and the spiritual sphere will often say, I had a very intense spiritual experience. Um, now, why, what they really mean by that is I, have a, I had a very intense, meaningful experience that is one of the most peak experiences I've had. But to label it spiritual is problematic because in the Islamic tradition, when we talk about the spiritual experience, we're talking about something very specific, very definitive, um, related to the realm of the spirit. And it has certain criteria, and there are certain conditions that have to be met. Um, uh, um, and, uh, but it is understandable how, when this collapse happens, people are not able to distinguish between a purely psychological feeling of oneness with a crowd, with a fundamental and true experience of oneness with uh, reality. I'm going to leave it at that, inshallah. Um, and there's a lot more that can be said, and a lot more will be said, inshallah, in part two of this presentation. Um, inshallah, we can now go to Q&A. Um, and please, I urge you all to keep your questions to the particular presentation I, I've done today and clarifications on the, the points I've made. Uh, because um, anything related to Ibn Sirin or particular dream interpretation is something I want to cover in the next next presentation, inshallah. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Barakallahu um, <clears throat> feekum, Dr. Samir. First and foremost, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Uh, in the Zoom chat, people are very excited to listen to part two as well, and there is a lot of reflections and questions. So before we start, just a round of applause to your members, brothers and sisters, to uh, to Dr. Samir for his great presentation. Feel free to use your digital uh, applause, or you can even open up your camera and just you know clap your hands. Thank you so much, Dr. Samir. It's such an interesting lecture, and I had the honor to listen to part of it uh, in our program with you at the Cambridge Muslim College. And... I really wanted all of our members and all brothers and sisters in ISIP and all of our groups to benefit from it. So we really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to part two. So let's Thank see God. here now, Dr. Samir. <clears throat> There's a lot of questions here. So I'll try to address some of them to you and then we can have a discussion as well, inshallah. So brother uh, Amir, he is asking Dr. Samir, who sees the dream, the nafs or the ruh? 
Is the nafs or the ruh a door seer of the dream or it only receives the dream as a recipient? If the dream is seen, does the nafs or the ruh has eyes with which it sees? How is the dream transmitted or communicated to the nafs or ruh if it's only a recipient? Hello, um, the, the, um, okay, it's an interesting, a very important question. Um, uh, the, I mean, I'll, I'll summarize it. Uh, the <clears throat> it, it, it really depends on how we understand the the spirit and and, and the nafs. Uh, in our contemporary language, we tend to confuse them uh, with one another. Um, in our deepest recesses of our being, um, the deepest recesses of our being and reality, the inner eye, as it were, is almost synonymous with our ruh. Um, which is the deepest level of our, our, of our being. And depending on what level of being we have acquired, or what level of reality we have accomplished and achieved, or tahqiq in our inner being, um, will determine which eye is opened up and which level of reality we are experiencing um, a particular dream. Um, that's the, so that's the, that's the first point. There are multiple, let's say, there, there are different depths of the eye, as it were. There isn't a single um, eye, uh, or inner eye, basira, through which we perceive things. There are multiple levels corresponding to the multiple levels of our inner being. Um, so that's the first thing to, and the highest, the highest forms of experience that are perceived by the highest inner eye, or inner, inner modality of perception. The second thing is that we are never passive in this thing. What I mentioned earlier, uh, that the spiritual dreams happen to us, what I meant by that is, essentially, the something is revealed from the unseen to us, but it is our faculty of imagination that actively gives it a particular um, form um, from the storehouse of images that we have. So we're never entirely passive. We're a lot more passive in our relationship to experiences from above. Um, we're much more active in regards to experiences from below because ultimately we become the source of uh, both the the image and the message. So I hope that answers the uh, that, that question. Um, <clears throat> short of elaborating too much of um, various models of the self that are quite complex in the Islamic tradition, I think that kind of response really summarizes um, uh, uh, the, the the gist of it. Inshallah. Barakallah fikum Ustad. Great response. Uh, also, we have Sister Fatima that is. Uh, writing down your responses so we will email all of these to all of our uh, participants today inshallah uh, and then we have a question from Sohail Khan your Dr. Samir he is asking when you talk about meaningful experiences where do our realization lie they are not images just insights we have sometimes is it realm of spirituality or physical world can spiritual world be not expressed in language alone or only felt in mind? Um, the, the, the spiritual, uh, let's say, communications come in all sorts of different forms. Um, but when we talk about dreams specifically, we're talking about the language of form and images. Um, and so we're talking about a specific type of um, um, inspiration or communication. Uh, one could be reciting the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reveal something, uh, a concept, an idea, an inspiration, a meaning to the individual, but usually in dreams, dream is, uh, let's say, the locus or the place within which we uh, experience communications from the uh, the beyond in the form of images. That's why they're called visions. So when we talk about dream, we're talking about a specific type of um, communications from, from Allah Ta'ala or communications from, from the beyond. Now, not all of them are from Allah, you know, dreams, um, um, have various sources. So the lowest types of dreams can have two sources, either the nafs, one's lower self, or shaitan. And um, highest dreams, visions, have a source from Allah or, um, or the spiritual world. Um, in between, in bet the dreams in between, what I call psychological dreams, um, they come from the nafs, but not necessarily the lowest part of the nafs. Uh, there's an intermediary part of the nafs, like a nafs al lawama that is not low, nor no high, it's somewhere in between. I think what we need today is uh, to further clarify this is to uh, develop 
a paradigm or a template um, or a conceptual model for the self um, and its various parts and map against that the various types of images and dreams and imaginations that we possess. Uh, sometimes what, what tends to happen today is we use a contemporary language of modern psychology to try to map it on a, a Quranic language, or we use a Quranic uh, 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 language to map it on our modern conceptual models. And there's a, often a lot of tension in that process of translation. Um, so I think part of the problem is in the conceptual models that we use. Interesting, interesting. Barakallahu fikum ustad. And yeah, they say the translator is a trader, isn't it? So that this, I mean, it's very important, mm. important to have that distinguishing that it's not about Islamicizing some other notions of dream interpretation, rather to root it in our tradition, which you're uh, doing in this lecture, mashallah. Barakallahu fikum for the answer, Dr. Samir. Uh, then we have from Brother Ali. He is asking, Dr. Samir, are are hallucinogenic experiences a type of dream or vision? Um, visions, no. Um, Islamic tradition categorically denies. I know, despite all the, uh, the so-called research out there about hallucinogenics, um, they, they can never be the cause. So let's say, for example, say Jamal al um has performed zikr all night. Um, and he's been on the path for a very long time, recitation of the Quran, a very virtuous individual, he fulfills all the conditions for having these kind of higher visions. And he happens to take a hallucinogenic, I'm not saying you do, but using it as an example. Um, then it is not the hallucinogenic that is the, the cause of the vision. Um, um, even in shamanic, shamanistic cultures, um, these kind of drugs were not used to induce or to be the cause of visions. They were there to, uh, to, um, to create a condition of loosening up the, let's say, inner, inner um, a perceptual faculty in order to facilitate something that the initiate was already capable of, if to facilitate something, not the cause, to be the cause of it. Otherwise, um, if a drug can induce a mystical experience um, in one minute that uh, would take a monk on a mountaintop to do in 40 years. That's absurd. Yeah? A drug does not alter your ontological conditions and all of a sudden turn you into a luminous being uh, that can have these kind of higher visions. Um, so uh, I don't buy into a lot of the literature out there that talks about uh, taking drugs now of course these drugs can induce experiences and visions of sorts sometimes but I, i'm using the word visions in terms of if by vision we mean seeing something then of course banging your head against the wall you'll see something um, anything will induce some kind of experience the question is where are these images coming from mm -hmm. what level of reality are they coming from and hence the importance of uh, maintaining these multiple levels of reality and also the criteria or forkan for distinguishing between them and the images generated therein. Because if we confuse them, and the nafs does this, you know, um, I've met many people who, and I, the example I gave earlier about this rock concert was uh, a concrete individual that I knew who was offended by my questioning of the experience as spiritual, uh, even though I had explained that what I meant by spiritual uh, is um, uh, spiritus, you know, the ruh, the ruh and amr rabbi, that ruh, which is the highest and deepest level of our being that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we say something spiritual, um, we either mean that or we're using the word in a meaningless sense. Uh, we mean, we're using it merely as a term to say, I had a very profound experience and I felt one, or I transcended my body. Uh, you can transcend your body through purely psychological experiences. They don't have to be the highest kinds of experiences or visions. Um, and so, uh, but individuals who who have never had these kind of higher experiences, and many of the, the, the awliya and ulama tell you this, individuals who have never had these kind of highest experiences um, will, will always refer to any experience they have, which is intense, overwhelming, and allows them to exit their body somehow as uh, the highest. But what they really mean by that, it's 
is it's the highest experience I've had thus far in my limited life. Not the highest experience, i.e. it's coming from the highest level of being. They're very different things, these things. You can have the most intense experience um, that, that is purely psychological and not spiritual. So these are important because there's too much confusion out there. And there's a lot of new age uh, uh, forms of spirituality. I like spirituality between quotation marks you know, parentheses, uh, and all sorts of forms of confusions out there. And I think um, it, it, it's one thing for people to fall into this trap. It's another thing when Muslims start doing it. Um, hence, I, I focus in this presentation on the importance of rehabilitating the faculty of the imagination. Um, you never hear the imagination or, and to a lesser extent, uh, the heart discussed and taught as an epistemological faculty of knowledge. We, we always hear senses, the akal, you know, we don't, we don't have a curriculum out there about the heart. Um, because the imagination is the faculty of the heart. It's the, heart, it's the heart's capacity to perceive uh, into and pierce beyond the veils of reality into um, the unseen. MashaAllah. <clears throat> it's actually so interesting, Dr. Sami, because it's kind of like we're living in this fast food generation where everything is like fast into all realms. So I guess that when people try to use this type of alternative ways or so-called ways with hallucinogenics and stuff, it's kind of like, you know, you want to eat a nice meza, Lebanese meza, but you instead go and buy a McDonald's burger. Like it's the quick fix rather than engage, as you say, in a spiritual path. And with that, you can come to higher level uh, with time, mm -hmm. uh, if Allah wants that, of course. So I guess uh, this new age movements are also very s significant for our day and age. And I want to recommend all of our participants that Dr. Samir actually has a thorough uh, you know modules in this in the IP diploma program at the CMC. I'm sure a lot of you already know about it, but I do recommend you guys to if you if you're able to really uh, try to do that program because it's an amazing program in many many ways. Barakallahu feekum, Dr. Samir. Let's go. There's so many questions, Dr. Samir. We will not be able to address all of them, so we'll try to sort them out. And then we have next session with you as well. Some people are asking, when will we have the next session? So, uh, dear brothers and sisters, we will discuss with Dr. Samir according to his uh, schedule, and we will find the timing for that, and we will announce it in all of our WhatsApp groups, our newsletter, also to all of you who registered today, you will get an email with more information about that. But it will be in the uh, near future, inshallah. We'll say like that. <laughs> That's our intention, at least. So let's see here, Dr. Samir. Uh, Sister Aisha from Indonesia, oh sorry, Sister Asia from Indonesia is uh, asking, Salam doctor, I want to ask, what about lucid dream theory? Some groups are learning to study and learn about it. So how we react about this phenomena as a Muslim? And what is your opinion about lucid dream theory and Islamic worldview? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we talked today about um, dreaming in terms of um, uh, when we go to sleep. Uh, and, and we'll detail the bit, a little bit that the stages of sleep uh, in the next presentation. Um, when we talk about lucid dreaming, uh, or we're talking about a category of types of vision that ha can happen in the waking state, which is uh, something that Islamic tradition talks about quite extensively. Um, and so there's a lot of material about um, the capacity of the individuals to do in their waking state what they do in the dreaming state. Uh, once again, what applies to it, similar distinctions apply. Not every form of lucid dreaming or every form of waking state dreaming or any, any, every, any form of active imagination that we perform um, is, um, is uh, in, indeed uh, a spiritual. So what I said about uh, sleep, uh, dreams and sleep similarly apply um, to um, uh, perhaps state, waking states. Um, and many of the scholars point out that um, one of the objectives of um, this, uh, embarking on the spiritual path. But one of the developments that happens along the spiritual path is the capacity to have visions in the waking state, not just in the sleeping state. So it's usually a sign of a, a progress along the spiritual path. Uh, but what I'm talking about here is spiritual visions in the waking state, not any type of uh, visions or experiences in the waking state. So that's important uh, to bear in mind. Yeah, and then that's a whole, whole completely different area uh, in the tradition that is often discussed at length. Imam Ghazali talks about it um, in, in the Ihya and, um, um, and it's one of the things that, one of the experiences that happens to the initiate as they embark upon the path. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a whole maybe area that we can um, discuss uh, at length uh, at a later point, inshallah. Inshallah, Dr. Sabir. Barakallah fikum. There is a question regarding dreams during Ramadan. So the question mm -hmm. is as follows. Uh, dreams come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the imagination and shaitan. Is it possible to have bad dreams in Ramadan? If so, what is the source of these sorts of dreams? Um, well, generally speaking, you know, the, the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that in the month of Ramadan, the, the, uh, the shayateen are shackled and restrained. Um, um, and so generally speaking, um, uh, if, we, if we are fasting and performing the prayer, fulfilling the conditions of Ramadan, um, the, the, the types of dreams associated with shaitan are significantly reduced, but not entirely eliminated because you have many people who don't practice uh, in Ramadan or um, maybe not fasting, maybe not praying. So month, the month of Ramadan, imagine the month of Ramadan in the following sense. When you enter into prayer, when you perform your five prayers a day, uh, what tends to happen is something quite remarkable and, and very beautiful. The moment you perform the niyyah, and you get up and you perform your wudu, which purifies your outward being and your inward being, uh, cleansing your heart and your mind, focusing exclusively on God, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you enter into prayer, you orient yourself towards the Qibla, therefore focusing the mind of the eye on the Qibla, but also the mind of the heart on the Qibla of the heart, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you enter into prayer and you start reciting the Qur'an, uh, and it creates this kind of protective barrier around you that wards off all shayateen and all the influences, you enter into a modality of existing, almost angelic-like, in which you are protected from the negative influences of shaitan, such that the experiences you have in salat are intensive moments in which the shaitan is barred access. Like you enter with a cloaking, you have a cloaking device around you, protecting you. That's kind of what happens in Ramadan, uh, over a whole month, um, provided one is uh, performing the conditions necessary for it. Um, so uh, while it's it's very um, it's a you know it's much less possible to have these kind of dreams, but if they do happen, uh, they can still happen either from shaitan or most likely the lower nafs. If one is still performing uh, all the conditions, they, most likely some of these visions uh, or dreams, or the lower ones, uh, come from the lower nafs itself, because your lower nafs is still with you. While shaitan is shackled, your lower nafs is still carried with you. Um, in the holy month. Again, it depends on the type of dream and vision one is having, one has to classify it. So Ibn Sirin and many others would spend a lot of time before interpreting a dream, classifying it first, um, you know, and uh, uh, running a long case study, case, case history of the individual in order to understand uh, a whole host of factors before they engage in the dream. So what I said was, is, is a general principle. It doesn't really, I can't really say it applies to Particular thing that you've, you've experienced, inshallah. Allah alam yani. This, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a, an expert in dream interpretation by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm trying to provide a, an overview in this presentation, general principles, inshallah. Awesome. <clears throat> we appreciate all of your knowledge that you're sharing with us, Dr. Samir, and we see that people are so interested in the topic. So definitely, we're looking forward to the second session as well, and to do more works when it comes to dream interpretation, uh, Dr. Samir. I actually had a personal question, but I'll try to take that in the end. We'll take uh, two more questions briefly, and then we'll try to summarize. Next question is actually regarding Ahlam. You mentioned Ahlam as lower dreams, uh, but in the case uh, of Prophet Yusuf Alayhisselam's dream in Surah Yusuf, is it mentioned with the same word Ahlam, isn't it? No, it said in the, in the, I think it, the word used is Manam. Not Ahlam. Okay. All right. Thank you, Thank you um, for. But yeah, I can, yeah, let's, 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 let's double check though. Um, uh, let me you want to let double, double check. Yeah. yeah, let me just double check 100%. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not clear. Uh, maybe it's mentioned somewhere else in the Quran. I'm not, to be honest with you, I can't really recall at this particular point. Uh, but I'll look into it. Uh, where. Where else it's used in the Quran if it's used in that particular uh, that particular phrasing? So give me. Um, so while we move on to the second question, I can try to find um, uh, find that inshallah. Inshallah, barakallahu fikum, Ustad. 
So there is a question regarding blind persons dreaming. Can the mm -hmm. blind person dream if they have no images like the ones we have? Hmm, interesting question. Um, I don't. I I don't know. Uh, honestly, I don't know. I have to. I'll have to. Um, I'll have to look into this question. Um, generally speaking, according to the theory, um, I mean, people can have. Well, if if dreams are visual, um, then. Um, then what they see is is um, is interesting. I don't know. Let me look into it. I'll think about it. It's a it's a challenging question. Um, is, they can yeah. dream. They can have experiences in sleep. But I'm just thinking: Are they visual? Are they clear visual images or not? Everyone dreams. Um, uh, people people you know many in the Islamic tradition. Many of the awliya have um, have uh, what's it called? Um, uh, many of the awliya have uh, experiences, mystical experiences and visions through smell and through hearing. Um, but these are intangible meanings that they, they feel and know um, and they can sense even in a dream. But that's not necessarily uh, visual. So if the question is, uh, can p blind people have mystical visual, uh, uh, sorry, mystical visions uh, or experiences? Yes, they can. Um, are they particular images in the center we're talking about? I don't know. I have to look into it, inshallah. Barakallah Fiko. Very interesting question. Yeah. So in, in the, on the question of Yusuf alayhi salam, um, the, the two words that are used are ahlam and adhaathu ahlam. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, the, the, you often find um, you often find the, um, let me just uh, see, I have to look at the whole tour, inshallah. But you often find in Arabic, at least, um, at least at the time of the Prophet, um, mm -hmm. and in one of his hadith, um, at least in the Arabic language, hulum is usually something negative. Um, and so uh, in the surah, it's denying that it's a hulum. It's denying that it's, it's that kind of adhat wa ahlam, that it's something else entirely different. So while the, the term is used in the Quran, it's, not used necessarily um, in, in the positive sense. Jazakallah khairan for clarifying Dr. Samir. I think we'll go to the last question. And uh, there are two questions that are pretty similar. Okay, we'll start by this question perhaps. So Dr. Bibi Jan from Singapore, she is asking, when one loses someone you love or child, spouse, spouse or parents, sometimes we dream of them in a certain good place. How do we interpret this? Um, interpretation will have to wait till the next one because uh, we, have to, we haven't done the, the conditions first for interpretation. So even, even in part two, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to engage in actual dream interpretation. That's uh, an art and a science that requires a certain uh, adab and level of expertise that is beyond my capacity. Uh, but what I will do is I'll talk about what the tradition has to say about it, laying the foundations for it. Uh, because there's a lot of things that we have to take into account when it comes to um, when it comes to dream interpretations and interpreting specific dreams. I'm, I usually run away from the interpretation of a dream. It's very difficult to do. There's a huge moral responsibility involved, um, and it requires not just mastering a certain science, but a certain malaka, a certain gift given by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And certain individuals have it, and some certain individuals don't. So um, <clears throat> now, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about here. Usually, I'm talking about the highest types of dreams. Not yet. Um, more mundane psychological dreams are a little bit easier to engage with uh, once, once someone knows the case history of the individual. But still, it requires a certain skill set. Hmm. So maybe we can, we can begin to look at that uh, area tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, sorry, not tomorrow. Uh, next time, inshallah. We would love to do it tomorrow, Dr. Salih. <laughs> <laughs> we, we want to study with you every day. So inshallah, inshallah. I think if I do a poll now with our, all participants, we will vote on tomorrow. <laughs> Barakallah fikum is that. You know, in Freudian theory, they speak about the Freudian slip. So perhaps that was a, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, you know, I, need to just, I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Samir, just as a last, because you, you spoke about, actually, it, what you uh, alluded to exactly what I wanted to ask you, and perhaps we can take it the next session with you, inshallah. But it's like, who is, who could do dream interpretation? Is it like any uh, certain, you know, 
you need to be educated in a certain way. You said that it's also intuitive and Allah gives you that gift. So that's what part of it. Because I mean, I studied Freudian dream interpretation theory and it's pretty like everybody who just do like psychoanalysis for like one, two years, they can do it. Like it's very like, you know, it's not as structured. It's mm. not as thorough. And of course it's, it's not connected to the divine. How is the Islamic tradition? Or would you like to uh, address that question in the next session, perhaps? It's up to you to decide. Uh, next session, but very, very quickly, <clears throat> very quickly. Um, like I said, I think what we need to do um, in contemporary scholarship on dream interpretation is to, once we've made these distinctions quite clearly uh, between different levels of imagination, different types of dreams, I think the lower types of dreams uh, are things that um, it's a lot easier for a uh, highly trained, skilled Muslim psychologists to engage in. Mm, um, yeah. And, and the, high, the higher forms, the ones that uh, you know, prefaced or preceded by Ra'ib, as Yusuf alayhi salam said, uh, because he didn't, see a, he didn't have a hilm or a manam, he had a ru'ya, a vision. Uh, those kinds require something else, something else. Uh, now, the question is, you have to make the distinctions and classifications first before you can say, okay, I can't do this interpretation, but I will engage with this one. And that one still requires a certain degree of um, uh, a training and, and skill um, that uh, is not just something anyone can, can acquire. Um, even Jung says uh, something along the lines that um, it's more of an art form that requires a specific intuition um, mm. and, and ability to perceive things um, that are normally not perceivable or normally a connection between things that are not always obvious. Um, and there's also the question of um, uh, uh, all the conditions, like knowing the case history of the individual, knowing the particular point in life that they're at, knowing uh, their background, um, um, establishing. Um, um, and I, I would add, actually, and this is something I want to get into next time, but I think we do need today um, we need to uh, a new f book, a new compendium on dream interpretation. Um, you know, most of the things that you see, that most of the things that are in the book, books of interpretation, we don't see anymore. Uh, we don't see camels. Uh, we don't see uh, all sorts of different things that are mentioned in there. Right? What do we see? Uh, what happens when you see an airplane in a dream or a car? Uh, all sorts of different things. So there's a monumental task of updating the repository of possible symbols and their potential meanings uh, within our tradition uh, to take into account so many different things uh, that are available today and their potential meaning. And so yeah. that, that's something, that's a, that's a can of worms that I didn't want to open now, but it's, it's something that needs to be alluded to. Um, and I have no answer for it. I, I have no answer for it, uh, to be honest with you. But uh, we need one of those 121 participants out there to dedicate um, their scholarship and work to do this because it's uh, it's, it's it's urgent. Uh, many of my Muslim friends end up going to therapists for interpreting their dreams, and I'm not sure they're the best people to interpret certain types of dreams. They may be qualified to interpret others, perhaps, but if they've made the classifications and the categorizations correctly, mm. um, you know, so that's important, inshallah. So so true mm. and. I think that was a great way to summarize the session that, that you're giving us like a task as students of knowledge, as students of IP, also those who are scholars or, you know, mental health professionals, that this is a task that Dr. Samir, and actually I think we all who are, you know, working clinically really see that this is important to update because, you know, we're using so many terminology, Dr. Samir, that is not rooted in our Islamic tradition. Like I just mentioned Freudian slip, for instance, or we use other terminologies like, um, looking at because popular culture has normalized so many essence of dream interpretation from perhaps more a Freudian point of view. I mean, even though I know Jung is much more, you know, um, uh, you know, compatible with our paradigm, nevertheless. So to update, because uh, I think for all of us who read Ibn Sirin's, man, Ibn Sirin's uh, Rahimullah's uh, manuscripts, as you say, a camel. Now, alhamdulillah, if you live like a Bedouin somewhere, maybe you will have that relationship. And that makes, that's, that's pretty significant, Dr. Uh, Dr. Samir, about the, 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 the dilemma of the modern person, the modern man. Like, we're not in nature anymore. So, you know, our dreams are more like with, you know, high skyscrapers and, as you say, airplanes. And what significance is it when you're taken away from your natural self to the urban self? 
and how does that affect your dreams, but also your personality and your constitution. And this is something that you also lecture a lot about. So alhamdulillah, we need to do that work. And we encourage all of you excellent brothers and sisters who want to take upon this task from Dr. Samir, please contact us. We will connect you with scholars. We will help you to, to engage in this type of scholarship. We have a lot of networks in ISAP. We have connections with excellent scholars like Dr. Samir and others who could support us in this work as well, inshallah. So feel free to write to us. Uh, Dr. Sister Fatima, put our email address there as well so we can facilitate brothers and sisters in this process of doing this type of scholarship, which is so important for all of us who are interested in IP. Round of applause to Dr. Samir. This is the last uh, segment of this uh, session today. If you want to open up your cameras and just do like clapping your hands or use your digital buttons. Uh, Dr. Samir, thank you so much. I speak for all of our participants, including ourselves as organizers, that this was amazing, amazing lecture. And we got a lot of new information and a lot of new insights. And we're looking forward to organize the next session with you. We also have highlighted um, Usul Academy. Uh, for those who want to study thoroughly, Dr. Samir is a part of the Usul Academy. Academy, also the Cambridge Muslim College and the IP Diploma Program, of course. Uh, we will share all these resources together with the ISAP resources and email for all of you who re registered. Finally, Dr. Samir, a lot of people are asking for the slides. Is, is it possible to share the slides or uh, we can email them out if it's okay with you? Um, that was a request uh, for some Let me see, because I prepared these slides as part of uh, an institutional lecture. All right, no and, problem. Yeah, so I need to check with the institution whether there's a copyright issue of sharing it or not. Now, that's why right. I haven't shared them anywhere since because they are um, they are used within a course. Um, All right. Not the exact slides here, about half of them are, are used in somewhere else. So let me look no into problem. that. We appreciate it that you, even though perhaps it's used in another course that you're sharing this information for us, it's also good enough. Mashallah, that's more than enough. So barakallah fiqh. Okay. All right, Dr. Samir, uh, we wanted to end by a dua. If you could lead us in a dua. Uh, I just want to thank all of our organizers once more, Dr. Uh, Sister Fatima, Sister Rua, Sister Shireen, and Sister Eileen, and thank all our brothers and sisters for joining today. It's an honor to be with all of you, and please forgive us as organizers for any shortcomings and all the good comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So without any further ado, Dr. Sami, could you just end the session by just doing it for all of us, inshallah. Inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this holy month, Allahumma a'anna ala siyami Ramadan. اللهم أعنا على قيام رمضان اللهم أعنا على تلاوة القرآن في هذا الشهر القضيب اللهم اجعل القرآن ربيع قلوبنا ونور قلوبنا اللهم اجعل النور من أمامنا ومن ورائنا ومن فوقنا ومن تحتنا وعن يميننا وعن شمالنا اللهم أرنا حق حق ورزقنا اتباعه وأنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وصلى لهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المسلمين Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much. Dr. Samir, send our regards to Australia. You know, it's very late for you. So thank Inshallah. you for joining.